Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open the word of God today, shall we ask for his guidance so that we may more properly understand the symbols and their implication for us at this time. May we truly join with him to understand that so that we may be fully prepared for the work that is yet before us. Shall we pray? <laughs> Loving Father in heaven, the more we study, the more we see our great need of you. And the more we come to understand our utter unworthiness. Father, please guide us today as we open your word. We ask for your spirit. We ask that angels attend us. We ask for your guidance and for your wisdom so that we may more, most properly apply that which we are about to see. Direct us now. Please be with us. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting. I thank you for your past guidance and for the guidance that you will give us today. Help us so that all the, with whom we come in contact may see your character so that we may do that work most properly that you would have us to do at this time in this earth's history. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we were, as we were discussing yesterday, we see that God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem so that the men of Shechem dwelt treacherously with Abimelech, and that the cruelty done to the threescore and ten sons of Jerubal might come, and that their blood be laid upon Abimelech their brother, who slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, who aided in the killing of his brethren. Now, when we're looking at this in the aiding of the killing of his brethren, the alternate Hebrew, of course, said, strengthened Abimelech's hands to kill. Abimelech sought for that for which he was not prepared. He did not wish to be a servant to any. He wished to be master of all. What does that say about the character of those that will come to provide legislation that would willingly trample upon the Lord's Sabbath and upon our Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. Can you uh, repeat that question again? Abimelech did not wish to be servant to any, but he wished to be master of all. Does this not reveal the character of those that would choose to legislate the day on which to worship? Well, it could, but that's not the context that I'm seeing here. Okay. Because we're saying Abimelech is a message uh, that's in the movement presently. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that it's the same, not because it is the same spirit, but um, that's not the context in which we're we're interpreting this. So, for this, in this situation, in this message. We have a situation. We have those who, like Abimelech, have chosen to become the arbiter of what is and isn't the message. Yeah, and 
I would say that, um, I mean, saying it's the same spirit as those that bring in the Sunday law, I think is correct. Because part of the problem that we have as Seventh-day Adventists, I mean, we can look at it just how the church treated this movement and then how the movement has treated people within the movement. Um, it's even worse than the church treated us. Right. Right. In in my perspective, uh, in my experience. Um, so, so this is the spirit that this is the spirit of Antichrist, of course. And, and that's the real issue here. There's, there's two different aspects. There is the aspect of a message, but it's not so much the message that's, that is, um, is the problem. It's how people are being treated. That's the real issue for me. People can be wrong about things. Right. Correct. But when they're, when they act in a way that is, well, for lack of a better word, papal, then that's that's sort of a, a bigger problem. Because we're, we're all wrong about things. I mean, the question is, are we teachable? Are we going to look at things objectively? Are we going to be corrected when we are in error? And the papacy has no intention of ever being corrected. Well, the papacy believes that they're never in error. Yeah, exactly. But the, the spirit that we have here, as it relates to this message within the movement, mm -hmm. basically shows a, a spirit that leads one away from the attitude of Christ and leads one away from the type of character that we are all to have if we are going to attend his wedding feast. Mm -hmm. We are not to, to judge or treat others harshly. This is not our job. What Abimelech did in this message, this false third angel's message is he had the blood of 69 of his brothers laid upon him. Mm -hmm. Now, they always say it's 70. I know. Right, which I think is an important point. They never say 69, though it is obviously understood that it's 69. Because he intended to kill all 70, so he's guilty of the blood of all of them. Yeah, but it also shows a rejection of the, the seven times and also the 70 weeks. Exactly. But it's done, at least, you know, as a pretense of, of doing what is right. that you know there's some kind of oppression that the that this other message is going to bring but instead this message brings an oppression but we haven't got to gaal yet no we haven't yeah. so the next verse And the men of Shechem set liars in wait for him in the top of the mountains. And they robbed all that came along that way by them. And it was told to Bimelech. So the men of Shechem set traps. Those that would lay in wait. Those that would seek to take what was not theirs. And they robbed all that came along that way by them. And it was told Abimelech. And Gael, the son of Abed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem. 
and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. Now, Gale is now introduced. Yeah. Why is this son of Abed important? What can well, we see here? So, I mean, there's another message. And this message, of course, is the message of loathing. Um, the name Gaal is actually, um, I, I don't know why somebody would name their child that. Um, but but it's 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 a guttural um, expression which really would almost show like gagging. Okay. So so it's um, that that idea of loathing in the sense of like choking on something that's really really bitter. So this is the next message that that comes because of. The failure of the message of Abimelech. All right. So this is the message that comes beca because mm. of the failure of the false third angel's message. Right. And and along with this too is also these these robbers that are are stealing something, you know, from people. So, you know, this is quite a serious issue. Well, in this situation, for the robbers that are stealing from these people, mm -hmm. the false third angel's message steals the understanding of the true righteousness by faith. Yeah, and it steals away the blessing, really. Most definitely. Yeah. Now, just as, as we are aware, Christ, in order to give the third angel's message, needed to leave the holy place and go into the most holy. Mm -hmm. There are those that follow him into the most holy. There are those that remain in the holy place that are deluded by the adversary. What do they receive? Those that stay within the holy place. Well, light and power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. The true message of righteousness by faith brings sweet love, joy, and peace. Can we say that the true third angel's message then brings unity of people and spirit? Is that not sweet love? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the ways you know that somebody, not that we can judge other people, but when you see people have bitterness, uh, it's not a good sign. Right. And I've seen lots of bitterness expressed. And um, even in myself at times, it's not a good sign. It's not, you never want to be bitter. And... And we become bitter when we, we take our eyes off of Christ's righteousness and we focus upon, you know, our disappointments, the things that we think that we can correct. Um, but if we had the confidence in the message of Gideon, we wouldn't end up uh, accepting the message of Abimelech. And definitely we wouldn't end up accepting the message of Gaal. So if Gaal is another message, would we say then that the message of Abimelech and the message of Gaal are, a, are part of a two-step message or will there be a third step? 
Because does not the false precede the true? <coughs> yeah, the false precedes the true. Because the people here are not understanding the true three angels' messages. They cannot be benefited by these messages. So the men of Shechem are now changing camps, as it were, because they no longer have confidence in Abimelech. They now have their confidence in Gaul. And they went out into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. So they went into the fields. They gathered their doctrine. When they tried when, when they were troding, or <clears throat> treading, excuse me, the grapes, they're making their wine. And the alternate would say that they made songs. So is that not worship? And they went into the house of their God <clears throat> and they cursed Abimelech. So they are rejecting this false third angel's message. They are believing that they now are learning when, in fact, they are rejecting everything that God has put before them. Any other thought about this verse? Well... The only thing I can think about is trying to figure out who Gaal is. And, I mean, he's the son of Ebed, which is a servant. And that is a bond servant, a bondman. Um, You know, I wonder if this isn't going back to uh, the Laodicean church. I think that's a good application. Now, now you know, of course, because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And, and that's sort of the sense of the name Gaal. It's... it's um, It's the loathing, right? Which is it's it's like a um, uh, a physical reaction to something by by you know gagging or choking or spewing or um, and of this of course seems to be where people go. Um, people just go back to the church. But this Gaal is the son of a servant. And it says he came with his brethren and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So, I mean, I don't know much about the history of this person uh, other than what they say here. So would, would Gaul be the son of a true servant or the son of a false servant? I would think a false servant. Well, I don't even think it matters whether it's a true or false servant. He was a son of a servant. And, and in this case, those that are, are slaves, those that are um, in bondage, and those would be those who have rejected 
the message of righteousness by faith because they're not free. But when you have the brethren of a servant, these men are now coming to those in Shechem. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> They're addressing this directly with Abimelech's relatives. <clears throat> and in a way of looking at it, they're going directly to the house of Abimelech. So... <clears throat> They went out into the fields. They went to collect their harvest. They gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes. They made wine. They made merry. Now, in this situation, the harvest is in. The grape harvest has been turned into wine. We know that this is part of a false message but if we were to look at this as a false feast what feast would it be well in gathering tabernacles right yeah yeah it would be that fall feast yeah So they're basically saying that our God is with us, but they're applying it falsely. Yeah. Now, um, Keel and Dillich make an interesting observation regarding this, uh, what, what's actually happening here. Um, they say he was a knight errant. That's the word they use who went about the country with his brethren, that is, as a captain of a company of freebooters, and was welcomed in Shechem, because the Shechemites, who were dissatisfied with the rule of Abimelech, hoped to find in him a man who would be able to render them good service in their revolt from Abimelech. Now, um, they say this may be gathered from the words and the lords of Shechem trusted in him. Now, if, if we were to take this interpretation, um, this would more aptly describe just the lots of the different offshoot groups that exist. And, and we have made reference to this, that some of the people are watching all these different videos of people dissatisfied with the church. So, I mean, that is another possibility. Um, though it doesn't mean I, I wouldn't think that many people go back to the church. Um, but yeah, so he seems to be, well, a freebooter. That's kind of an interesting term. Um, but that's sort of, you know, kind of what you would get from this. But <clears throat> if we were to look at this from scripture, we would have Isaiah 16, 9 and 16, 10. Therefore, I will bewail with the weeping of Jazer, the vine of Sibna, 
I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon, and Eliaba, or Eliala, for the shouting of thy summer fruits and for thy harvest is fallen, <clears throat> and gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. And then Jeremiah 25, 30. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. <clears throat> he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, and they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. What would we see here? Well, this is the harvest of the wicked. Sort of like in the end of Revelation. So we have <clears throat> we have a people that view their actions as righteous, but they're not righteous. They are taking a portion of the cup that is in the whore's hands. So this is not good doctrine. This is not good wine. This is not wine that is brought to a people in gladness. Because it's not pure. Now the following verse. And Gal the son of Ebed said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is not he the son of Jerubal and Zebel his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. For why should we serve him? Do we recall who Hamor was and who Shechem was? Yeah, they were involved with the uh, trying to, to make peace after Shechem had, had raped Dinah. Here were a people within the promised land where when Moses had given instruction that you shall make no covenant with them, there was not to be an agreement with these people. Now, during the time of Jacob, these people, Shechem and Hamor, his father, sought a covenant with Jacob. This was one of the things that had been warned to Abraham that was not to occur. Because these people would lead the children of Israel away from the worship of the true God. So Gal is saying, he's questioning why they were so willing to follow Abimelech. <clears throat> why they were so willing 
to follow one of their own family. And who is Shechem that we should serve him? He's questioning multiple points. Now, um, Hamor is the, the word that's translated ass in the Bible. Okay. Um, you know, such as in Genesis 22, 3. Um, where Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, etc. So there's all different examples of, of this word, chamor, which, um, you know, we use as a symbol of Islam. I don't know if that's relevant here. We would do that. Well, mentions the Balaam settling an ass too. So could this be referring to a false prophecy or a false prophet? Yeah. I mean, it's a different, there's two different words that are commonly used. The other one is uh, a thon, like in Balaam's story, it's going to be a different word for ass. But, um, um, and they also have another word for horse, and there's a few different words that are used. But um, so it says here, the Gaal, the son of Ebed, uh, some manuscripts say Eber, uh, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is not the son of, he the son of Jeroboam? So one is he's associating him with, with Gideon, at, which is something that is a message that's rejected. So even though you have on the one hand, you have these men of Shechem who follow uh, Abimelech, Abimelech is also a son of Gideon, and uh, but this Gaal is rejecting that entirely. And, and then Jabul, his officer, and Jabul, Jabul, his officer, serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve him? So they're saying uh, they need to serve Hamor, right? So if, we, if they need to serve Hamor, if they need to serve the ass, Is this also not serving the message of the ass? Yeah, so there's something there. And of course, this is mostly Genesis 34, where you have Hamor. Um, well, you have Shechem, the son of Hamor, is referred to all the time. So they don't really talk about Hamor, just Hamor, or, or Shechem. Um, Shechem, the son of Hamor. Okay. Um, this is interesting. Joshua 24, 32. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt... Um, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, which, of course, we know this story. It just reminds us of where uh, this connection lies. For a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. Hmm. So what would the connection be here then, symbolically? Would this be a false returning to the old paths? Hmm. Yeah, 
but even the idea that Jacob bought this land that Joseph is buried in, because if we think about these, so we've been taking these people as representing messages, and and we sort of have always, even though we talk about these lines, because we have the story of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Joseph, but now we have Jacob has bought this land. Um, bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. So they're not going to buy it from Hamor. It's just the descendants of this man. So they use his name, but they never run into Hamor personally. Um, and it's bought for 100 pieces of silver by Jacob, and Joseph's bones are going to be buried in it. So is this some kind of message? then can we look at this as a message? And if it's a message, what message is it? Why did Jacob buy this piece of land? Well, originally in Genesis 33, um, it says, And Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle, Therefore, the name of that place is called Sukkoth. And Jacob came to Shalem, the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it Elohoi Israel. Um, so I mean, he just, it was land that he bought because he was living there. He wanted that land. Um, here, I don't see anything more than that. And then you're going to have the situ situation with the defiling of Dinah. Right. Now, you're going to have Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. So you are going to run into Hamor here. But he, they, they bought, Jacob buys the land from the sons of Hamor. Um, but in this situation, Hamor, so he must be an old guy, is going to come to talk to Jacob. So Hamor is in this story. I would say Hamor is definitely in this story. Yeah. <clears throat> so... When we're looking at this, as the translators would have looked at it, when Gaul is asking the question, who is Abimelech? We have a couple of other examples from 1 Samuel 25.10. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? <clears throat> there be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Is Gaul breaking away from his master, from his father? Is he breaking away from Abimelech, who is implied as his master? And then we have 1 Kings 12 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we with David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse to your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. What is being said? Here in 1 Kings 12, 16. What example are we looking at? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, the one with the ball, I think, is fairly well known. Mm -hmm. Now the other the other point when we're dealing with this with Hamor, we see in Genesis 34 that Shechem has an action prior to his father coming to commune with Jacob. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, <clears throat> prince of the country, saw her, saw Dinah, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Shechem saw Dinah. Shechem did not know who Dinah was. He just saw that this was a girl that he wanted visually. He desired her. He took her. He laid with her and defiled her. And four verses later, Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. My son has done what he should not have done. Amends need to be made. How are we to make these amends with this large family? So Gaul is questioning. He's questioning the legitimacy of Abimelech. He's questioning the legitimacy of this message that Abimelech is presenting. Mm -hmm. But he's also recognizing that Shechem and Hamor are not without fault. So he's laying the issues of this message at their feet. And then, of course, when you come further, we return to this portion. And would to God this people were under my hand. Gaul is saying, if you would listen to me, it would become better. Because 1 Samuel 15, 4, Absalom said, moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. What was the net effect of what Absalom was doing? Was he not saying that my father David has not been fair with you? I will be more fair with you.
and would to God this people were under my hand, then would I remove Abimelech. Was not this the desire of Absalom to remove his father David? And Gaul said to Abimelech, increase thine army and come out. Is Gaul not calling out this false message? Is Gaul not calling out one false message with another false message? Well, that's definitely what's happening. And, and this is the danger. I mean, this is why, um, you know, when we look at what the counsel that's been given us, we look at what happened after 1844. What happened after 1844? You had all kinds of different churches who inherited the message of Miller, right? Different Adventist groups. Um. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is by far the largest of them that survived the Millerite movement, but uh, there was many other groups, and some of them quite fleeting. Um, so, you know, the danger, the snares that are there, if we can't be corrected by God, if we don't follow the counsel that Ellen White has given us, are many. There is a, um, an error packaged for each one of us that suits our natural temperament, that appeals to our pride. And we see it all the time in Adventism. You see it all the time in social, social media. People who have their very particular views or understandings on things that makes them special. And... And yet they're just all winds of doctrine. And so that's what we see here. And so that's the great danger that this movement faces, the people in this movement face, is that they could get up following just one message after another. And we need to be consistent. So one thing that we, we understand is that there was a foundation that was laid. And that foundation first begins with the message at least for us as Seventh-day Adventists, the message of Miller. So we have a foundation that's laid in Millerite history. And that foundation is laid properly. You know, people get off the foundation, the platform, they examine it, they see it's laid correctly, they get back on. And we have the same thing in our time. We have a message that was given by God, a foundation that was laid correctly, and we have to be careful that we don't end up rejecting that message, even while we profess to believe it. I mean, I deal with people all the time who are offshoots of FFA in various different ways that came at different times into the movement and left at different times and had particular things that they thought they understood that Jeff didn't understand. And... You know, so we've seen that. We've seen the people leave the movement at various times. But here, you know, we have something, this in Judges, we have this message that's in the midst of our movement that's demanding attention. And it is not a correct message. It's the message of Abimelech. Even though it is a son of Gideon, it has a rejection tied into it in this message, a, re a rejection of the seven times and a rejection of the 70, uh, the 70 weeks. And particularly, if we look at the, the truths of the 70 weeks, this is all tied to our July 18, 2020 prediction, if we understand it correctly. So, so this is a rejection of July 18th, even when it professes not to be. It's... It's a descendant of Gideon, 
but it's also a rejection of the true message of Gideon. So Gaal is now, and the men of Shechem in their rebellion against this false message, they're just going to go deeper and darker into error. And that's why we need to be corrected before then. We need to understand the light that is behind us so that we may more clearly see the path that is before us. And if we're not studying the light that's behind us, and, and this has been my contention, it, if you want to use that word, is after July 18th, it became very clear what we needed to do. But a large part of this movement has been doing a type of study that is, um, for lack of a better word, not to offend anybody, but it's kind of simplistic. That is, they're the things that we should already know as Seventh-day Adventists. They're, they're really the milk of the word. And that's not what happened after 1844. They were looking for the light that explained their disappointment. And that's what we had to be doing. We needed to understand July 18th what it actually meant. So to me, I see lip service to July 18th by some, but some completely ignore it. They really have no interest in it. Agreed. And yet they're still in the movement. So I'm, I'm, I'm never quite sure why people do that. Um, You're at a loss for words on this as to why they would choose to remain within the movement, but reject July 18th. Yeah, it's just like, why would somebody be a Seventh-day Adventist when they don't believe in the 2300 days? I mean, wouldn't you just leave? But, but people stay with it because they want to either change the movement in their direction, right? Or that's just where their friends lie. I don't know. I, I it, quite, don't quite understand the motivation of it. If you reject the 2300 days, you're also rejecting the seven times. Mm -hmm. If you're rejecting this, you are rejecting the foundation and central pillar of Adventism. If it's you, just, yeah, okay, go on. If you reject those, then under what banner are you standing? Well, yeah, and if you put it in the context of this movement, so I have a hard time understanding people's thought processes, but to me, we need to know, we need to understand the information, right? We, I mean, we need to, to sort through a lot of things. Agreed. Why somebody wouldn't do that, I, I can't for the life of me imagine why you wouldn't. Um, because if I was them, I would be, if, if I rejected July 18th, I would have to have a good solid reason to do so. I would have to have some explanation. At least that's how I would have to do it. I would have to have the reasons I would have to to look at every single point and find where we went astray. I wouldn't just dismiss something for no reason. But but this is what's happening is things are being set aside and and not even openly. People are deceitful. Um and I know they're deceitful because they say one thing in public, but they say another thing in private. You know, they're deceitful of where they stand. So they won't speak openly against things that they don't agree with that they know wouldn't be popular. And that to me is not, um, it's not wise. 
because we're going to end up in this situation where this loathing is going to take over if it hasn't even partly already occurred. I think it's already occurred. Yeah. I, I can't say that if I'm seeing, yes, it's here. Yeah, well, it's definitely the bitterness is here. And, um, but it's going to manifest itself in a message that's going to be a complete rejection of this movement. However, we want to look at it, whether it's going back to the church or whether it's going off into other offshoot groups or even just going back to the world. Um, that's where it's leading. And so, so the problem here is, you know, what should we do about it? You know, well, again, we can't do anything about other people's choices. I mean, we can present a message. We can obey the truth ourselves. But it, to me, it's just, uh, you know, I feel helpless in, in, in this situation. Because when people have bitterness, um, when people have opinions and views of others, I don't know how you could change that. It's like in a marriage where the the wife despises the husband or the husband despises the wife. You really don't have much hope in ever restoring that marriage. So unless God's spirit comes and, and melts our hearts, does something to us, we're going to end up with this situation for many, many people. And we have to be careful that that doesn't happen to us. Right. Agreed. Continuing on to the next section. And when Zebel, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gal, the son of Abed, his anger was hot. His anger was kindled. So is Zebel some kind of uh, mayor of Shechem? Not sure who he is. I'm just asking. Well, if we're if we look just a little bit before, I mean, in verses verse nine twenty eight, Zebel is the officer of. Uh, Abimelech. He's the yeah. appointed. He's the appointed one. Yeah. So that word means superintendent, civil, civil, military, or religious. But here they say that he's the ruler of the city. So, so that would mean like a type of mayor or something. Or is this? Well, is again, is he ruling this civilly or is he ruling this religiously? Um, well, usually if you're a ruler of the city, it's usually civil, but. You know, because, you know, at first officer, I would think he's like a military person or something. Okay. But, but that word means superintendent, civil, militarily or religious, that at the charge of the governor, office, overseer. So, Hakid. And Hebrew word. So, um, but it seems to be here that he's some kind of mayor. But I'm not sure what that would mean symbolically. And and his name Zebel means dwelling. Hmm. You're right. How would you apply this? Becomes a big question. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he becomes angered. He's the one who's going to warn Abimelech. Well, but he sends messengers. He, hmm. Zebul, sends yeah. messengers 
unto Abimelech privily, craftily. Yeah, and the word privily, you know, often we think of just privately. At least that's how I always think of it. Um, but this means through deceit or fraud, the word, the Hebrew word here that's translated privily. So is Zebul now aligning himself with Gaul? Well, he's, but he's, I mean, his anger kindled towards Abimelech? Or is it uh, kindled, kindled, kindled towards Gaul? Well, why would why would he send messengers to Abimelech privily if he was still in agreement with him? Yeah, and then he but then he's sending this message. So yeah, so if it's a deceitful message, behold, Gaal the son of Eb, Ebed and his brethren become to Shechem, and behold, they fortify the city against thee. Now therefore, up by night thou and the people that is with thee, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be that in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, thou shalt rise early and set upon the city. And behold, when he and the people that is with him come out against thee, thou mayest do to them as thou shalt find occasion. And Abimelech rose up and all the people that were with him by night, and they laid wait against Shechem in four companies. And Gaal the son of Ebed went out and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And Abimelech rose up and the people that were with him from lying in wait. And when Gaal saw the people, he said to Zebel, Behold, they're come down from the top of the mountains. Um, there come people down from the top of the mountains. And Zebel said unto him, Thou seest um, the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. So he just, so Zebel says, No, you're just seeing the shadows on the mountains. Those aren't people. And Gaal spake again and said, See, there come people down by the middle of the land, and another company come along by the plain of Meonium. And then said Zebel unto him, Where is now thy mouth, wherewith thou saidst, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. Um, so it seems like either Zebal has his own kind of plan, um, and anyway, Gaal went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech, and, and it's going to go on. So I, I don't quite understand this story. Um, so the idea is that Zebal is angered by Abimelech, or is he angered by um, Gaal? Well, if he is angered by Abimelech, why would he give a warning? If he's angered by Gaul, is he not setting a trap? Yeah, I'm just not sure that he's actually um, – yeah, I don't know. It, it, yeah, it's just this word uh, privily, right? That's the word that, that would give us an indication he's using some kind of deceit. But, you know, maybe it does just mean privately. I mean, that's how the King James – Translators are translating it because when they use the word privily, it means secretly. Right. But the Hebrew word means deceitfully. But then we have this this also. And Gaul spake again and said, See there there come people down by the navel of the land, the middle of the land. Yeah. And another company come along by the plain of, now how do you pronounce that? Meonium. And those are the regarders of the times. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. Okay. We're given, so, we're given yeah. this portion from Deuteronomy. To yeah. They're, they're sometimes called observers, uh, enchanters, soothsayers. 
Um, so this this portion from Deuteronomy to to give reference back to this. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses useth's divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Hmm. We're speaking more here with those that we would say would be observing witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this would be a counterfeit of, of, you know, prophecy of how, I mean, there is this uh, counterfeit sort of divining or observing of the times that isn't according to God's word. Right. Which we often get accused of. But, uh... And then Zebel said unto him, Where is now thy mouth? Wherewith thou saidest, Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? So here is Zebel now referring back to Gaul. Mm hmm. Yeah. So he's saying to Gaul, you know, okay, you said these words. Now you need to, to prove it by fighting. But I still, I'm, it's ambiguous to me from this which side Zebel is on. I mean, you would think, my first reading of it is he was on the side of, of Abimelech. You know, in, well... You know, in the sense that he was he wasn't he wasn't for Gaul, I guess maybe is the way I should put it. What if he's sitting on the fence? Okay. What if, what if he's one of these, well, what will be will be kind of people? Well that that would make more sense. Because okay. he want, he wants to see which side is going to be victorious before he chooses to throw his lot in with that side. Time will tell. Yeah, time will tell. I don't know if I would see this as a double agent or if I would see this as, as a party that is unwilling to make their stand. Yeah, I, I think that makes much more sense. And and I don't believe the time will tell is is um a biblical principle. No, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think mean, it's it, it's sitting on the fence in the worst possible way. Right. Because we need to we have the sure word of prophecy. Right. Our faith and confidence is based in God's word. We don't say, well, we're going to see how, how prophecy turns out, and then we will decide, you know, where we stand. Uh, that's not what we should do. I have had conversations with those that choose to deride the message of July 18th. And a comment that's been made to me many ways, especially when the, the example is used of Methuselah, of Lamech, 
and of Noah. That I'm trying to, to have it, quote, both ways. I'm trying to say that this was a prophecy, a warning regarding the destruction of Nashville, and that I was wrong for promoting this before people. And now that it hasn't happened, that I'm backpedaling because it hadn't happened to say that this warning is yet to occur. Sort of like uh, Seventh-day Adventists with the Millerite disappointment. Right, exactly. Yet these same people are choosing to say that they're part of the movement and that they believe fully in the seven times and all of the other prophecies that have been accepted, but they don't want to, to look to understand or to study the light that has gone before us. Uh -huh. Okay, so what, what we see here then is we have this message of Abimelech, and it's in contrast to the message of Gideon. Correct. And, and we have that within the movement today. Right. Um, but there are those who are going to want to wait and see what's going to happen. Right? Correct. So, and, and then you also have this Gaal. So you're going to have some kind of, I mean, this hasn't happened yet. But, I mean, what we can envision happening is, um, and maybe, maybe we can say that this Gaal has already begun, as you suggested. So you have different camps. You have the ones who are opposed to, um, you know, they're opposed to Gideon. They're opposed to any kind of thing to do with the message, right? You have um, Gaal, which is opposed to, to all of that, either side, right? And then you have those that just are sitting on the fence and want to wait to see what's going to happen. So it would it would just demonstrate the different classes, uh, the different ideas. But these are also messages, right? So there is a message that is just a wait and see message. There is a message that is a message of bitterness or loathing. There is a message that is opposed to uh, July 18th, but it's it's not um, it doesn't think that it is right because it's it's trying to to keep that heritage, but yet it's it's rejection of the seven times in the seventy weeks. I don't know. Does that make sense to people? Is there some other way that we should understand this? It, it sounds reasonable to um, put it that way. So, so we're heading for a mess, in a sense. It, it's going to be a time in which it's not going to be clear cut for everyone unless they are studying. Those that are refusing to study, especially refusing to study the light that has gone before us, the light that is behind us, are going to make a shipwreck of their faith. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember back, um, so back in 2018, when, when I saw that there was going to be this uh, a betrayal, Judas's betrayal was going to happen in 2019. And I, I didn't really know how it was going to happen. I mean, I had some scenarios of possibilities of how it was going to occur. Um, but 
one thing that was clear is that the movement was heading towards some major divisions and that November 9th was going to mark that. And my position is that November 9th was not what people thought it was going to be, where they thought it was a close of probation where they would then be sealed and they wouldn't sin anymore. This was a very common view in the movement. Um, and I knew that that wasn't the case because I I just studied the week of Christ and part of the week of Christ study, which I haven't really dwelt on too much, had to do with the symbols of the close of probation. We have the stoning of Stephen at the end of the week of Christ, for instance. But we have other things that are marking closes of probation as well in that study. And But these were all types of something. And, and the people who close their probations are the wicked. The righteous don't close their probation. The pl close of probation for the righteous occurs one time. Well, it occurs when you die, but it also occurs at what we call the close of probation. That's when Michael stands up. That's the close of probation. Only then will he that is righteous be righteous still. Um, you know, in any sort of general kind of close of probation. Now, when we look at how things would unfold, um, the one thing that, that we saw is that, or, or the thing that I even worried about is, was it going to be clear cut? Like we always, before when we had these falling aways in the movement, uh, the, the choice was just to follow Jeff, right? You were sort of safe if you stuck with Jeff, even if you didn't understand everything. Um, and it, be, it was pretty obvious actually when you looked at the groups that left that they weren't leaving with a good spirit. They weren't, they were, they were critics, but they weren't offering us anything. But people still followed them anyway. Um, but I thought that what was going to happen in 2019 wasn't going to be clear cut. In that we would, you know, and it's just like with the Sunday law. We always just imagine this clear cut thing. You wake up one morning, you see the newspaper, you see the Sunday law on, on the front page, and you know where you stand. But as we move through time, we can no longer get, get in on somebody else's coattails. We have to stand as individuals. Every earthly support will be removed. We have to understand the truths for ourselves. And we have to be truly converted. We can't have some halfway conversion. We can't have some intellectual or a merely intellectual conversion. And we can't just be going by you know, our feelings. We have to be spiritually converted. We have to be obedient to the truth. We have to be settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so we cannot be moved. And as we move through this history, this becomes clearer and clearer um, that unless this individual work is done, we have no safety. We're not going to know where to stand. And we can't just say, you know, time will tell. In other words, we need to stand up and be counted. Well, that's true. But, you know, our it's an individual work that's being done. Isn't always this an individual work? Yeah. But, you know, what I'm saying is that there was a time we, we had clear cut sides, you know, when, you know, path of the just left and so forth. And we might even say to some degree, even with, the, with Parminder, it was at least somewhat clear cut. It took time to sort through the deception. Um, but here it's not a matter of standing on one side or the other um, in, in that sense. I mean, we really do have to know where we stand. We have to know why we have taken the position that we have. Nobody's going to be safe just saying, well, you know, this person's ideas make the most sense, so I'm just going to go wherever, wherever they lead. There's no, not going to be any safety in that. 
if there ever was safety in that, but especially as we proceed. So this becomes pretty difficult for those who aren't studying and don't really know what they believe. But I would say that's the vast majority of the movement and always has been. That we basically, in spite of the fact, you know, we think we're independent and we're not followers, we really are just followers. And in some ways, worse than the people who are in the church. One is because we have greater light and we know better or should know better. We should very definitely know better. And Jeff has always pressed that point, you know, study this out for yourself. But how many people actually followed his counsel? Well, when we saw what happened in 2019, we can say almost nobody. And even many of the people who stood on the right side were on the right side for the wrong reason. So that doesn't really help you. And Gael went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech, Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him. And many were overthrown and wounded, even unto the entering of the gate. And Abimelech dwelt at Aruma, and Zebul thrust out Gal and his brethren, that they should not dwell in Shechem. What are we being told here? What? Well, Abimelech, this message has some kind of a victory. Right? Right. It's going to dwell at the height. That's Aruma. That means the height. Um, and... Um, which technically it means I shall be exalted, um, comes from the word height. And um, now Zebal, this one who was sitting on the fence, he now is going to take a position against Gaal because Gaal loses. Is right. That, is that what we're saying? Correct. And that they cannot well in Shechem because he's – the mayor, he can uh, kick anybody he's, up once. He's the administrator of Shechem, yes. Yeah. So this, this battle is leading to a division. Mm -hmm. And the false message of the third angel's seems to be strengthened right and so it has some kind of victory for some reason that we haven't foreseen right and that's going to make it more difficult for people as far as knowing what the truth is right because the one sitting on the fence now they're going to be supporting abimelech or that message And, and both those messages were false. So, I mean, they had a choice between two false messages. Exactly. So... As they're overthrown and wounded, even unto the entering of the gate. Now, <clears throat> at the gate, was that not where the, the civil decisions were being made? Was this not the important portion of a city? Would we not have seen that in the study of the book of Ruth? Mm -hmm. So 
So Abimelech dwells at the heights, and Zebel thrust out Gaul and his brethren that they should not dwell in Shechem. And it came to pass on the morrow that the people went out into the field, and they told Abimelech. Why are the people now talking directly with Abimelech? And where is Zebel? And he took the people and divided them into three companies and laid wait in the field and looked and behold, the people were come forth out of the city and he rose up against them and smote them. So Abimelech is doing what his father, Gideon, had done. He's divided the people into three companies. We don't see 300 here. We just see the people mm -hmm. divided into three companies. And Abimelech. And the company that was with him rushed forward and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And the two other companies ran upon all the people that were in the fields and slew them. Now, we're going to have to go back over these. We're going to have to consider these these examples that we're seeing today because we're close to our time mm -hmm. of ending today. Let's give some consideration. Beginning in Judges 941 and see what we're able to come up with when we return and meet tomorrow. Are there any other comments or questions? Any other thoughts that we might want to consider before we separate for today? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for these lessons that you are presenting before us. Direct us today, Father. Help us in all that you would have us to do. We wish, Father, to walk according to your law, under your banner. We need, however, your strength and your wisdom. We need your character in all things. Direct us now. Be with us, each one that have attended this meeting. Be with those that will view this later. Help us now so that we may come to an understanding so that we may more clearly give the message that you would have given, the true message and not a false message. For this opportunity, for this blessing, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.